Okay, let's go ahead and um, get started. So, ah, more people, Karanji from Fremont, Fremont in the house, Michael from Gilbert, and we're gonna go ahead and get started. So my name's Michelle and I'm on the marketing team at Swing Education. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, who've never been to a speaker series before, um, welcome to our Spring Swing speaker series. And I think we're gonna have a lot of fun today we are going to be talking about how to use techniques from improvisational theater in the classroom. Um, so one thing I would love to know from you guys before we get started is how many of you have experience with improvisational theater? And what I'm gonna do is push out a quick poll. So you'll see a little pop-up on your screen and just go ahead and check all that apply. So we'd love to know what's your experience with improvisational theater? Maybe you've been to a show, maybe you've tried it out, maybe you don't know what it is, that's okay too, just, just let us know. And, um, oops, I've got to launch it, here we go. Uh, maybe you've seen it on TV. Okay, so it looks like people are starting to take that poll. Um, so just a couple of notes for those of you who are here for the first time, you will notice that you do not see your faces on the screen. Um, that is because this is a webinar format. It's not like a typical Zoom meeting format. So you will just see Ken, you will just see me, um, but the chat window is open so you can chat amongst yourselves. Remember, we get a recording of the chat. So don't say anything in the chat that you wouldn't say in front of the whole class. Um, and then as we go through the uh, interview, and you have questions for Ken, go ahead and jot them down in the Q&A window. So there's a couple of windows in your Zoom, there's a Q&A and a chat. So questions that you want Ken to answer, put those in the Q&A, and then um, when we get to Q&A, we will get to it. So it looks like people are starting to answer the poll. Oh, wow, 50% of people have been to a live show. Almost as many have answered, uh, watched virtually. Um, couple people have participated, this is fun. And a couple of people are like, what is improv? So we are definitely gonna get to that. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. All right, now I'd like to introduce um, Ken Adams. Ken is a 30 year veteran of improvisational theater. He has produced, directed, acted in, taught improvisational theater. He's also an author and he also creates um, techniques and tools for, um, other improv instructors to use in their own instruction. I hope I said that right. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, Ken, welcome to uh, Swing Speakers. Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm so delighted to be here. Great, and um, sounds like you're putting on a show tonight from what I recall. Uh, no, 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 we're not putting on a show tonight. We are in rehearsals for our next show, but that won't be until January. So what are you, uh, what's the next show? Uh, Synergy Theater, we perform full length improvised theater in different genres and styles. And our next show is Spontaneous Charles Dickens, a oh, full length wow. improvised <laughs> play in the style of a Charles Dickens novel. That actually sounds um, epic. Just a little side note I did go to one of Ken's shows, and it was improv in the style of Shakespeare. And you will, I mean, their slogan is you will not believe it's improv. And that is like so on point because you cannot believe it. It's, it's pretty amazing. Thank but, you. um, Ken, I'd love to start uh, by hearing a little bit more about you. So I understand that you were a substitute teacher early in your career, and um, you want to tell us a little bit about that and how you ended up doing um, improvisational theater. Yeah, absolutely. Well, to be honest, theater came first. Theater was always my passion, and I uh, started off being most interested in playwriting, and that's what I studied in school and then in graduate school. But in graduate school, as I was finishing up my master's in playwriting, that's when I discovered improvisational theater. And I started working with a company in New York, which is still going on to this day. They're called Freestyle Repertory Theater. And I, I learned how to improvise by improvising in a show format called theater sports, which is very similar in some ways to the show Whose Line Is It Anyway? that many people know from television. It's short comedic scenes based on audience suggestions. And then it's like a sporting event and the audience votes on which team they like better and there's points and a winner. So that's how I learned to improvise. Um, because I was always so interested in storytelling and playwriting, I quickly became very interested in improvising not just short comedic sketches, but plays to really see what the potential of this art form was that I was learning about and getting so excited about. So 
uh, that's been my career focus ever since. I've kind of taken my passion and education in playwriting and funneled it into improvisation. I wrote a book called How to Improvise a Full-Length Play, The Art of Spontaneous Theater, in which I write the, the approach that I now use as we direct and innovate um, full-length improvised plays with Synergy. Great. So I think it might be helpful um, to just define what improvisational theater is. And I know in our previous conversation, you had said sometimes people conflate it with stand-up comedy. Um, so maybe you can uh, school us here on how we should be framing this. Sure. So improvisational theater is spontaneous theater. Improvisers get on stage and usually based on suggestions from the audience, they make up a piece of theater. They play the characters and they create the dialogue and the action <clears throat> right off the top of their heads. So that's what improvisation is, spontaneous theater. Now, in fact, because of the nature of the art form, we're making it up and the audience knows we're making it up, it is often very humorous. And, and we don't shy away from that. Um, we, we love to improvise comedies. But because my particular focus is on improvising theater, and the understanding is that not all theater is comedic, right? You, you can write a comedy like Neil Simon does, but you can also write a drama like Arthur Miller does, or you can write a melodrama or a farce or any type of theater. And improvisation has all of that potential as well. If, if you can write it, you can improvise it. So um, we, we don't always improvise things that are intended to be funny. Many moments of our improvised plays are quite serious or poignant, and we hope to um, experience the range of emotion just like theater does. So mm -hmm. because the phrase improv comedy is so famous, improv comedy, people who aren't really familiar with what improvisational theater is assume that it's stand-up comedy. Mm -hmm. and, and those two things are quite different. Uh, they're two very unrelated art forms. And so uh, that's why I prefer using the phrase improvisation, or improvisational theater as opposed to improv comedy, just so nobody feels they are going to be expected to get up anywhere and do a stand-up routine if they're learning how to improvise. That sounds quite intimidating. <laughs> to be yeah, honest. yeah, yeah. I would be intimidated too. So, but it's not that. It's something very different. Cool. So, do you think there are any? I mean, obviously, we wouldn't have you here if um, we didn't think this was the case. But what are the commonalities between substitute teaching and improv theater? Um, yeah. Well, the, the, so improvisation has a couple of different uses. And one is as a performance art. You can improvise theater. Then there's this whole other thing that we refer to as applied improvisation. And applied improvisation is when you take the skill set of improvisational theater, the, the behaviors that we'll talk about soon that allows you to improvise well with others by collaborating instantaneously and apply it to other areas. For example, you can apply it to working together in your corporate team, in your corporate workplace, or you can apply it to uh, the relationship between a leader and the direct reports who report to that leader. Or you could apply it um, to the relationship between a teacher, substitute or otherwise, and their students. And, and the basic skill set boils down to understanding how to treat each other with a certain amount of of respect and a certain amount of understanding that prioritizes the other side above yourself. So that mm -hmm. I'm prioritizing you, you're prioritizing me, and we're making the entire team look good as a result of that. Oh, that's fascinating, because I doubt that many people have thought about it in exactly that way. Like when you're watching a show, you don't necessarily think that that's the dynamic behind the scenes. Uh, exactly right, exactly right. So to, to spell that out just a little bit more, um, there, there's become a phrase that is so popular now, it, it has almost worked itself into the common vernacular, and that phrase is, yes, and. And uh -huh. that, in a nutshell, is the improvisational uh, dogma, yes, and. and. And what that means is to take what your partner is, has done, respect it, and build on it. Now, when Synergy Theater teaches improvisation, I rephrase it just a little bit, and I have what I refer to as the three rules of improvisation. Great. Yeah, that's a great segue. I was just going to ask about that. 
Um, yeah. So, uh, and these are the rules of improvisation that we use on stage with each other in order to create spontaneous theater, but also the behaviors that we teach when we're teaching applied improvisation workshops. So mm -hmm. uh, there are three of them. One of them is be spontaneous, and that has two meanings. The first one is to um, act on instinct so that your creativity is allowed to flow through unfettered. And the other one is to be present, to stay in the moment and really understand what the moment entails and how best to react to it. So be spontaneous. The second rule of improvisation is always make your partner look good. Improvisation is a team sport and you sink or swim based on how your partner is doing. So it is my job to make you look good, your job to make me look good. And then finally, always build on your partner's idea. So be spontaneous, make your partner look good and build on your partner's idea. And if we could create that type of relationship between the teachers and the students and the students and each other within a class environment, then we could be achieving all of our other objectives with this understanding that it's everyone's job to make each other successful. I have so many questions about that, but one thing I forgot to ask you is, um, so we know you're an instructor and a teacher in terms of um, teaching improvisational theater to other people. What about like a classroom setting? Do you think there's a, a difference in that, between that type of setting, like an academic setting and a theater setting? Uh, well, well, there is for sure, um, especially when you're dealing with children, if, if you're mm -hmm. teaching and uh, your students are children. Uh, one of the differences is that with improvisational theater, when you're creating art for the sake of art, uh, we, we like to say that there's no wrong answer. What, whatever your character wants to say at the moment, as long as it's observing those rules, spont being spontaneous, making your partner look good and building on ideas, then there's no wrong answer and we can, we can go anywhere. Now, in, in a classroom situation, that is not always the case, especially based on what subject matter you're teaching. So in math and science, there, there are right answers and there are wrong answers. So uh, it, the environment needs to be such that we understand that this doesn't mean that there are no wrong answers. What it, what it means is that you, you are making an effort to find out what the other person is trying to achieve and helping them achieve it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think some of the benefits are of using these techniques in the classroom? Uh, it, it's very empowering. And, and I will say there are two ways you can use improvisation in a classroom. One is by teaching the students how to do simple improv games and exercises. And that's what I spent, um, and, and I still do it. In addition to working with adults, I've been a professional teaching artist for 30 years now, going into schools, teaching improvisational theater to the students. So uh, just like I would teach it uh, improv to adults, we teach it to the kids and they are marvelous at improvisation. And in that context, when they really have liberty to allow their creativity to run free and it's all within the restrictions of you know this is school with school rules so obviously there are you know we're not gonna curse or hit anybody or do anything like that but as long as you're in the moment making each other look good and building on each other's ideas um any anything your character wants to say they can say that there is such freedom and empowerment in that and you, you see the, the students just light up when they realize the, the freedom and the privilege they're having in being able to do this. And, and they just have so much fun and their, uh, their creativity comes out in ways that it often doesn't uh, have room to shine in other more structured events. Yeah. So let's get back to this idea of um, spontaneity. So based on what you've told us, it sounds like this could be particularly useful in substitute teaching. So we hear stories of, you know, I had a lesson plan, but either the kids zoomed through it or it was a little bit flimsy. Um, or maybe you're in a situation where you're teaching for the day and there's a student who's being disruptive. Like how does spontaneity play into those types of dynamics? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And uh, I think the most important thing is um, as teachers, we love very much to be prepared with lesson plans, making sure we know how every moment of the day is going to work out. And of course, 
things don't always work out the way you hope they would work out. And what you learn from improvisation, this concept of being spontaneous is that again, it's, it's not just acting on instinct or being random or saying whatever happens to pop into your mind. It's being in the moment and understanding what's happening in the moment and how best to react to it. So if, if uh, I come in with a lesson plan and sometimes you know you're, you're in the middle of it and you just realize, this is not landing. You know, the kids aren't doing anything wrong. It, it's just either I planned it over their heads or something's wrong today, but it's not landing. The spontaneity would allow a teacher at that moment to, to acknowledge that, to realize that, be okay with it and, and simply change, simply get, give up that agenda and find something that will work without feeling any pressure to cling on to the plan. And I think that's one of the most valuable. Example? Like Forgive what, me? You, what, what would be a concrete example of like, okay, I can tell that this lesson is not landing. People have checked out. Like what could, what could you pivot to in that moment? Right. Well, for, for one thing, stop doing that lesson at that moment, right? <laughs> if, if it's not the right time, then it's not the right time. And then it comes down to those three rules of improvisation. Make your partner look good. What do the kids need at this moment in order to succeed? Mm -hmm. Maybe they need to get up and play a quick, uh, you know, walk around the room improv game. Or maybe they're really itching to get back to that art project and you weren't intending to. So you're able to go back over there. The, the big takeaway is, you know, th th there are so many things we need to achieve in the school classroom. Yeah, the, the bell rings and everybody leaves and you have to go to the next chore. You're, you're uh, managing lunch duty and yard duty and homeworks and standardized tests and all of that, that, it, that it's very easy to get to, to get very, very trapped in in routine, very trapped in routine. And, and improvisation teaches you the the luxury of realizing it's probably not that big a deal. If this moment doesn't work out exactly like you expected it to, it's probably not that big a deal. And, and we're servicing the kids better if, if we allow that understanding and allow the moment to change. God, that could be so powerful. Just like not feeling like you're pressured to check those boxes and that you do have the opportunity to make a change based on how you're reading the room and what's going on in the classroom. That's, I don't know, that just sounds really powerful to me. Uh, but yeah. I do want to talk a little bit more about this idea of making your partner look good because I had some time to think about this. And what I thought about is when you're an adult, like we're all in the working world, we're familiar with this concept of like make your boss look good. But when you're younger, you don't necessarily have the emotional development to see the value in that. So how do you persuade a group of like middle schoolers that you're going to benefit if you make the teacher look good? That just seems like anathema to them, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, and let me say that I, I do understand uh, and I was a substitute school teacher in a in a very inner city junior high school for mm -hmm. uh, for far too long for for a year. And, and I really, really do know the struggles there. Mm -hmm. uh, I really do. Um, and and I, I, I am not suggesting that this is like a magic bullet, like you're going to walk in and suddenly you're going to be Willy Wonka and, or, or Aesop and all the kids are going to gather around. Uh, it, it, it's not going to be that. And there will be challenges. However, um, th when we say make your partner look good, it doesn't it doesn't mean make sure your partner looks good in front of their bosses. Like that's kind of what we mean when we say it in the work world, right? How are you going to make your boss look good um, by making her uh, seem in front of her boss that she had done something successful? Uh, and and so look good, what, what that really means is make your partner successful. How can you make me successful? I'm the substitute school teacher. I don't know anyone here. You folks run this classroom. I'm the stranger. How can you be kind? and make my day successful. And I promise you that my only goal is to be kind in return and make your day successful. How can we simply agree to work together in order to put the focus on each other rather than ourselves? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I will say that that um, restructuring of the language into kindness and respect, middle school students do understand that. And I, I certainly can't say that that will touch every kid. And I'm sure that, you know, there are still kids who are going to act out. That's what happens. But I do think 
if you go in there with the attitude that I'm the boss and you better do what I say or else there's going to be a lot of yelling and we're all going to get in trouble, that that is probably a, a less helpful way of starting out than starting out by saying, so my name is Mr. Adams. Uh, in addition to teaching, I do this fun thing called improvisational theater that I'm going to teach you how to do today. Um, first, there are a couple of rules to improvisational theater. And not only is that how we're going to play our games, but those are the rules that I would like our classroom to work with today. And here they are, be spontaneous. What does that mean? You have a conversation and you talk about being present, being in the moment. Middle school students do understand that. Mindful meditation is very big amongst uh, kids nowadays. Uh, there, there are programs all over the country that bring mindful meditation to schools and work with kids. And this concept of, of connecting with yourself and yourself to the environment is, is quite popular and kids do resonate with that. So be in the moment, really be aware of what you're doing and how it affects other people. Um, make your partner look good. Think of everyone as your partner, not just me, the teacher, but everyone else in, this, in the classroom. How can you focus on making their day successful? And they're going to do it for you. Uh -huh. And then finally, build on your partner's idea. How, if someone has an idea, how can we value that idea and turn it into something better? So if you promise me that you will try to treat me that way today, then I promise you that I will try to treat you that way today. And in order to practice, everybody get up and make a circle. We're going to play a fun game in, to, in order to practice those skills. That is... Um... That also seems powerful and also seems realistic too. We've just got some um, comments here that I think are interesting. Jennifer says this could go hand in hand with SEL. We just had a speaker speak on SEL um, last week and we're gonna have another one next week. And it's, there's just so many parallels in terms of actually, you know, allowing for the spontaneity, allowing for the pivot, having that real conversation where, you know, you can make me, if you um, are kind to me, I can be kind to you. So like expressing what the benefit is to everyone and then Delaney is saying, love it. These are life skills as well as sub skills. Exactly. I'm totally going to use this on my boss. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I did want to ask a little bit about connecting with an audience. Um, you may have already kind of answered this in a different way, but what I've been thinking about is like, if I go to see theater, I am, you know, signing up, I'm buying the ticket. I'm going of my own free will. I want to be there. I can't wait to see what you have to show me versus in a, classroom where you know children don't have agency over going to school they're like told to go and they go um how do you think about connecting with a class where people might either the students might either be like indifferent that you're there or a little rattled because you're not the regular teacher or they might try to get into some kind of power struggle like how do you think about resonating or connecting with that audience when you're the new teacher um yeah, that, that's a wonderful question. And, and that is that is definitely something that we are taxed with as improvisational theater performers as well. And, and frankly, even though I hate to draw this connection, stand-up comedy is really dependent upon that as well. This idea of reading the room and creating a rapport with the audience, that, that really is a very palpable and tangible thing and a skill one develops after performing again and again getting in front of an audience and there's this like interesting triangular relationship. There's the relationship between you and your partner on stage that are improvising the scene together, but then there's the audience and they're also connected in that. And that idea of being spontaneous of really getting a sense of how is the audience reacting to what's happening right now? Are they engaged or are they not engaged? And if they're not engaged, how, how what do I need to do to re-engage them while not breaking the, story or the make-believe that I'm creating with my partner on stage. Um, now, the, the people listening to this have, I'm sure, more experience than I have. Um, and so I'm not pretending to, you know, again, have any magic answers to this. But, but I do believe a lot of it has to do with breaking down that barrier, breaking down that fourth wall between the teacher and the students where I'm on this side, I'm big, I'm right, you're on that side, you're small, and you're wrong. Um, and awesome, often we go into, especially a sub situation, because you're expecting that antagonism, you kind of go into it with your defenses up and the, it's thought of kind of as an antagonistic relationship. You know, how am I going to win this class today? How am I going to win this war today? Uh, and maybe if we went into it more with taking down that barrier between the 
stage, the teacher's desk in the audience, the students, and, you know, starting with, look, we are in this together today. We are all part of an ensemble, which is a fancy theater word for group. We're all part of this ensemble and ensembles have to work together in order to succeed. Let, uh, I'd like to talk with you about how we're going to try to do that. So, so you create a team as opposed to a, a me versus you. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that must be a relief to the students when you walk in there and you say right out of the gate, you know, I am, I want to be part of your team versus like, you're going to follow my rules or, you know, something like that. I mean, I can see how that would be disarming right off the bat. Yeah. Um, and, and again, I always, I always want to acknowledge the realities because I, I know if I, when I was substitute school teaching in that, uh, middle school in, in the Bronx, if, if I sat in an audience and listened to somebody say what I just said, I think I would be rolling my eyes quite a bit, knowing what some of the things is that I deal with. So I want to point out that, you know, obviously safety comes first, right? If there's some kid and they're acting out and they're hitting some other kid, at some point, you just have to be the authoritarian. You have to lay down the rule. And, and, and none of that is negotiable. All, all of that is very important. So, you know, it's, it's within that. It's, um, a, taking all of that for granted and understanding that this is not going to be a, a cure-all for every situation and won't always work but when it can work when when the energy is such that this can be created it, it is very helpful and empowering um one, one of the things i i did a lot with that um, the middle school group that i was teaching back then was um improvising based on like real moments from their life. That's something we do in improvisation all the time. We get like a story from the audience and then we improvise a day in the life of that audience member. Uh, and, and we would do things like that with these middle school kids and, and some of the stuff that would come out of them. You know, these kids who just like sit at their desk with their head down and they don't give you the time of day or they'll yell out a curse word every once in a while. But, but then, um, you know, you have them come up and improvise a scene ab about, you know, life at home. And um, one of them, I remember very specifically this one thing where this one kid was playing who I can only imagine was his own somewhat abusive father. And the, the other kid came home and this kid like took his belt off and started threatening the kid with the belt. It was, it was all make-believe. He was doing it very well in character. But but the, the kids in the audience were just laughing and laughing and laughing. And he had like this little boy smile on his face, you know, from this hardened, uh, hardened, fellow into just like this happy little boy playing because he he finally had an environment that was safe enough to vent some of these feelings uh, about his home environment um and, and that changes the dynas the dynamics between the teacher and the class like after experiences like that there there is a group sharing that that creates bonding and and it's really quite powerful that is um, such an interesting story because when we heard from our SEL speaker, they were talking about that group sharing as well. So I think, Jennifer, what you were saying about the overlap is there are so many ways that this overlaps. One thing I did want to ask you, Ken, is have you ever been in a situation where um, an improv technique just went completely sideways? Like, is there anything we should think about not doing? <laughs> or maybe you just want to tell well, us. Well, <laughs> um, well, yes, this is a this is a very interesting thing. I, I don't know if this is exactly what you're looking for, but this always struck with me. What, one of the very important things in improvisation when you're working with each other is that the performers frequently need to make eye contact with each other. And that's something we practice because that's how actors on stage connect with each other and, and create a visceral emotional connection with each other by making eye contact with each other. And improvisation, there's a lot of games where we stand in a circle, make eye contact with someone across the circle and send them a signal of some sort that they catch. And, and, and I was running this with a group of middle schoolers once and, and they would not for the life of me make eye contact with each other, almost like defiantly so, you know, they, they would not, no matter how often I coached them, they wouldn't do it. And then after, the class was over, one of the kids pulled me over and he said, uh, Mr. Adams, that thing with the eye contact is, if you're walking down the hall and you make eye contact someone, that is perceived as a threat and that could endanger you. So th these kids are trained not to make eye contact because in their community, that is a threatening gesture. And that really was a, 
a light bulb. You know, that made me really understand that I need to understand this community better. So you see, it's it's not making them look good if I'm forcing them to do something they feel uh, endangered by doing. Right. So uh, that that was an example of something that did not work and turned into a, a lesson which helped me moving forward. Mm -hmm. And so I bet you deployed some of your spontaneity by trying something else the next time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, he didn't tell me this until the class was over. So <laughs> he told you, you know. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess one thing, uh, last thing I wanted to ask is I know we're going to get to QA. I know you have a hard stop at 445, but um, do you have any recommended like reading? websites, resources that um, we can share with the audience if they want to learn yeah. how to do this? Yeah. Um, so so one thing is I, I would encourage people not uh, not to rush too quickly into getting your kids up there to improvise. Go, go up there and, and make up a scene about blah, blah. Um, unless they have this practice and they know how to do it with these rules, be spontaneous, make your partner look good, build on your partner's ideas, then that they you know, they will, for one thing, they prop their, their work probably won't be very good and, and they won't get a lot of joy out of it. But also if there, there'd be very much danger of them starting to insult each other or let just like do all of the things that poorly trained improvisers do. And that's not helpful. So I really would encourage understanding the art of improvisation, learning it and teaching it well to the students, um, before just getting them up there and, and having them improvise a scene between two you know, cowboys or something like that. That there are many, many ways to learn how to do this. Um, one is, especially now in today's times, there are millions and millions of online improv classes. You could be anywhere in the world, sit down just like we are now and take a class with instructors from literally all over the world. Um, Synergy Theater, my company offers a full array of online uh, improv classes and, and so do uh, hundreds of companies. Um, also, if the where you live, if the world is opening up again, there there are in person improv classes, you know, probably within 30 miles of, of where you live. There, there's just somebody teaching improv everywhere. So so I would encourage people taking an improv class. If, if this is interesting to you and you want to bring it into your classroom, take an improv class and really learn how to do it well so that you could teach it to your students well um, in just in order to find access to the different games and activities that you could do with kids there are tons of resources online and a real good one is called improvencyclopedia.com improvencyclopedia.com and that's just a catalog of improv games um, and it's broken down in category uh, categories so like character games or group building games so that's really good also uh, there's a lot of sites that are devoted to uh, offering improvisation games and activities specifically for kids in school. And if you just go on Google and search improv games for kids, um, improvisation for children, to do any kind of search like that, uh, dozens of resources will pop up and, uh, and, and you'll be able to investigate that. Yeah, that seems great to have in your, your sub kit for when your uh, lesson plan ran, runs short. But um, for those of you in the audience, I did also want to flag that um, the online courses that Ken offers with the Synergy Theater, I posted the link to that on our website. And so I'll be sending out the link with this uh, recording and that if you want to go check that out too. And I'll um, pull together some of these other re resources and publish them as well for you guys. Um, well, let's get to Q&A. Okay, somebody asked, will there be a recording of this to watch later? Yes, there will. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, do you guys uh, have any questions for Ken? Don't be shy. <laughs> Maybe I should just answer a few and then people could ask questions. <laughs> What's the most common question you get? Uh, 72. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think this is a sign that your presentation was very comprehensive. Um, sometimes we get a ton of questions. Sometimes we don't. Let me just double check here in the chat. Ah, Delaney says, just want to say thanks. This is a great topic. Thank you, Delaney. 
And uh, McLena also commented that these are life skills in every sphere of life. Yes, absolutely, I agree. Um, Okay, well, um, before we log out, I did want to pull you guys to see, where's my poll? There it is. Really curious to know how comfortable you feel trying some of these techniques. Let us know. So you think you're ready? You think you're willing to try? So that poll should be, I'm ready, let's go. Great. Um, sorry about that. Okay, so most people are saying I'm ready, let's go. We got a few people saying I'm somewhat hesitant, let's try. Someone wants to try but doesn't feel ready, so check out our resources. I'm really sorry about the dogs. My um, magic speaker that muffles them is not functioning today, so sorry about that. But it sounds like overall people are really interested in giving this a go. So Ken, I want to thank you for um, joining us today. Um, I learned a lot and it was really fun. Uh, you, you are very welcome. Um, I, I, I did see a question pop up right uh, at the end there on the chat about a, a way to get things oh, yeah, started. You know your sure, thank you. Uh, the thank one you. right before that. I agree as a sub, improv and spontaneity are important, can save the day. Thank you for the great ideas and suggestions. Oh, from Michael, how is a good way to start a class and break the I'm the boss impression? Great question, Michael. Yeah, um, again, I, I think I would encourage some, some practice and study of improvisation perhaps before this, but uh, one, one thing that is very powerful, if, if you have the ability to do it with the configuration of the room, one thing that is very powerful is, is to start off by getting in there and saying, um, hi, I'm Mr. Adams. We're gonna start off today with an activity. Everybody push your desk aside and make a big circle in the, uh, around the outside of your desk and start with an improv activity, start with an exercise. Um, it's fun, the kids love it. Uh, it, aut it automatically starts the, uh, the day off uh, on a interesting note and creates a, a, an ensemble and a group feeling. And then after that first activity, everybody can sit down and then you can say something like, now let me explain what we were doing. We were doing this thing called improvisational theater and, and then you're off and running. That's a great answer. That sounds like something that, you know, wouldn't be too um, challenging to try if you were just dipping your toe in the water because, you know, anyone can make a circle and do an exercise like that. So yeah. some of the exercises that you mentioned that you can find online just by Googling improv activity for, for kids, um, how much experience do you have to have to try some of those out? Is that something that somebody could just like test, say, tomorrow if they were subbing tomorrow? Yeah, you know, like you, you could go on line you could find a couple of group building games there's lots of games where everybody stands in a circle and and people do various things that trigger other people to do things that there's a ton of games out there that anybody can go online find and bring into the classroom and on some level that there will be some that there'll be a, probably a great deal of success there what one thing is though that again when uh, uh until you have a great sense of comfort with these this concept of be spontaneous, make your partner look good and build on each other's ideas, you're tempted to try to make them do the game right. And, and improvisation is all about allowing innovation to happen through mistakes by building on mistakes and turning them into ideas. So one of the dangers of rushing too quickly in, into this type of stuff is the, is the danger of like stopping and correcting kids as they're playing the game um, if they make a good natured mistake, if they're horsing around, that's a different thing. But but if they're really trying and it doesn't quite work or uh, or something different than expected happens, the tendency to correct it and make it right. And and we try not to do that. We try to discover what happened and what can we make of what happened. Or if, it, if the game didn't work exactly the way you expected it to, what is happening? And maybe that's the new game that you've all innovated together. So So it's that sense that you can bring to these activities once you've taken some improv classes yourself for a while. Got it. And we have a question from Michaela. What's your favorite game to play with elementary age students? Um, uh, th there is a wonderful game that I love so much. I'll try to explain it. And, and I know nowadays with COVID, um, a, lot of, a lot of these games involve becoming being very close to each other and physically touching each other. So 
I don't know if we can play these games at the moment anymore, but there, there's a wonder, and maybe, and there's probably a workaround to this, but there's a wonderful game called Fruit Salad. And with fruit salad, you need a wide open space. You need, you need to push all the desks out to the side. You need to have the open, the middle of the room clear. All the, all the kids meander around and you tell all of the kids to find a partner and stand back to back. So everybody finds a partner and they stand back to back. And then you tell them, okay, this is your Apple partner. Whenever I say Apple, find this person and stand back to back. And then you have all the kids meander around the moon, meander around, then you say Apple and they all run and they find them. Um, and then you do that a couple of times. Then everybody finds a different partner and this time they stand facing each other. And that is their strawberry partner. So whenever you say strawberry, they do, they find this partner and face each other. But whenever you say apple, they find that other partner and stand back to back. And then they walk around the room, walk around, walk around, apple, strawberry, apple, strawberry. And then there's a few others that you can mix in there. So um, uh, as the game gets more and more sophisticated, there can be four or five different partnerships that they're, they're all um, maintaining as they run from one to the other. The, Children will play this game for seven hours a day. They never, ever, ever get tired of it. Um, and it, and it builds such a wonderful sense of ensemble and community. Another thing that I, that I put on there is that one of the rules is as they're going to their partner, they, they cannot get touched. So they have to like run, you know, move in and out of each other. Um, but without touching each other. So for one thing, that's a safety measure. So the kids just aren't knocking into each other, but it also helps develop this sense of personal space. That, and how, how we can, <laughs> yeah, how we can work together well, but still be, you know, conscious of our own safety and our partner's safety. Yeah, that's great. Um, looks like we got some people who are definitely going to try that. Jennifer has a question. Do you have any suggestions I could? Use? on how I could use the chicken dance. I am not familiar with the chicken dance. <laughs> um, I don't know how one can improve on the chicken dance. I say just. <laughs> you want to tell us what <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a silly dance with um, different, you know, ha um, motions. But this is not a children's thing. This is like, you know, uh, on the cruise ship dances all through the 80s and 90s, uh, the chicken dance. I, I'm a little surprised to hear that people are still doing the chicken dance, but um, good on you. <laughs> um, related yeah. to the funky chicken or is that <laughs> a type of chicken? Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. Um, we, we do do a thing, uh, we do, there is a, an, an exercise called um, dance freeze or, or something. And, and the way that works is you play music and when the music is playing, everybody can dance freely or you can dance the chicken dance, you can pick a dance and do it. And then whenever the music stops, everybody has to freeze in whatever position they are in and freeze dance. Thank you. Thank you. Freeze dance. Um, and, and then they stay frozen for as long as the music is off. And then when the music comes on again, they can dance again. Kids love that too. I, honestly, I don't really understand why, but but kids will do that forever and ever too. They love that. And that is really good too about self-discipline, you know? Like, can you be free and spontaneous and express yourself when it's appropriate, but can you be still and quiet when it's appropriate also? Ah, oh, that's fascinating. It's definitely an uh, academic application of that as well. Um, well, I know you have to get to rehearsal. Um, so as much as I would love to keep you here, I'm gonna go ahead and cut you loose. This was delightful. Um, thank you for joining us and um, good luck with your show next year. Oh, thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. And uh, I really enjoyed this so much. I'm, I'm very right. honored to have been here. All right. Good night, everyone. We'll send you the resources. Bye-bye.